Okay, great. Thanks very much for having me. Um, so everything I'm going to talk about and more are in these two manuscripts. I think the um, uh, the this is going to be you know available on YouTube, so you'll be able to look those up later. Um, <clears throat> So a number of well-known, you know, predictors of poor child development outcomes, such as watching a lot of TV um, or playing video games, um, childhood obesity, um, not being talked to very much. So there's a correlation uh, school success in terms of how much your parents talked to you when you were little. And um, a lot of public policy has been very inspired by these correlations um, and involve um, trying to intervene on parents to uh, get the parents to change um, essentially their parenting practices. So, um, for instance, you see you know, guides on how to control screen time or um, get uh, your children exercising more. Or in this um, viral clip from um, the, uh, the last presidential cycle, we have to make sure that every single child does, in fact, have three, four, and five-year-olds go to school, school, not daycare, school. We bring social workers into homes and parents to help them deal with how to raise their children. It's not that they don't want to help. They don't want, they don't know quite what to do. Play the radio, make sure the television, the, excuse me, make sure you have the record player on at night, the, the, the phone, make sure the kids hear words. So Joe Biden got a lot of flack for um, suggesting that parents should be playing their record players or possibly phonographs. Um, but what was interesting was uh, to me was how much there wasn't pushback on really deep assumption here, which is that these are basically cultural problems with cultural solutions. Um, as opposed to, there's another hypothesis that's been floating around for a while, but has uh, made much less of an impact on public policy, is these are actually resource problems with resource solutions. Um, so I was first, um, or so a particularly nice, um, you know, exposition is in this 2005 Margaret Talbot article in the New Yorker um, that was about Providence Speaks, um, or Providence Talks, I believe. Uh, which actually was a program in which they were sending social workers into low SES households to teach the parents to talk to their kids more. Um, anyway, a quote that I, that I want to point out here is, Richard Weisbord, um, a senior lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, helped establish a campaign in Boston that urged parents to talk to their kids, and he organized focus groups with low-income parents. You had some people working three jobs or dealing with a steady drizzle of helplessness and hopelessness, he recalled. That makes it hard to have vibrant conversations with a baby. They'd say, look, when I get home, I have to clean and cook and do the laundry. They're exhausted. They'd say, sometimes we have to put our kids in front of the TV. Weisbord said of interventions like Providence Talks, maybe we had the model wrong. Maybe what we need to do is come in and bring dinner and help with the laundry and free up a parent to engage in more play with their child. So again, to summarize this, you know, hypothesis one is that parenting practices um, for thinking about screen time lead to more screen time and more screen time leads to obesity, nearsightedness, behavioral disorders, and so on. But it's also possible that screen time is um, is really a symptom. So familial, like low familial resources, lead to more screen time and also obesity, nearsightedness, behavior disorders, etc. And so intervening on screen time itself is not actually going to do anything. Um, and obviously, to test this, you would need to do a manipulation study. Now that's very hard to do. Um, these are hard variables to manipulate. One of the outcomes, actually, of Providence talks was they just weren't able to get parents to talk to their kids more. Um, which is interesting in its own right. Um, but COVID manipulated the family resources for us, right? So it took a whole bunch of people um, and not entirely irrespective of SES and race, but still more cleanly than usual, um, you know, affected people sort of across the board in terms of what sort of family resources they had. Um, particularly through school and daycare closures, loss of social support um, and networks and babysitters, things like that. Um, and for some uh, folks, increased work at home. So here's a schematic of my own household. Um, so I, my daughter turned two just before the pandemic. She wasn't really a TV watcher at the time. Um, uh, and then the daycare closed and suddenly she was watching you know, Frozen like three or four times a day. 
Um, and then uh, my mother-in-law came to stay with us for a few months and we were back to not watching any TV. Then she had to go home and we were back to watching lots of TV. Uh, and then um, my mother came to stay with us and the, the um, screen time went back down again. Then she left, uh, but then daycare started again. Um, and we were back down to not a whole lot of TV. Now, this is what we call an N of one experiment. So we wanted to see how this generalized. Um, and fortunately, there were a lot of data sets we were able to get a hold of that had relevant data. So we used data from the Kaiser Health Tracking Polls, AP NORC, um, the COVID Impact Survey, Understanding America, um, our own survey that we had, were running, um, and also real good streaming data. So real good is a streaming aggregator and search service. Um, so they had, you know, real time, you know, roughly geolocated data on how much people were watching um, child oriented television um, and movies and whatnot. Um, so this is, um, you know, from our real good data, so the actual ground truth streaming data, and you can see um, all the schools um, closed within about one week. Um, daycares were a bit more variable, um, and there's just not good data on that, but daycares are mostly around that time period. And you can see a real spike in increase, uh, like a big increase in um, screen time um, immediately afterwards. But of course, lots of other things were going on at the same time. You might think, well, you know, maybe people were watching more TV because they were sick with COVID. Um, and that it actually didn't track COVID rates all that particularly well. Um, in particular, if you look at these numbers, so we see screen time, you know, rising rapidly in March. And in March, you know, as a first approximation, nobody in America had COVID, right? It was quite rare um, and it located in just a few places. There was actually no time, so you can see here on the left, um, sort of the increase in streaming by, you know, like March 16th, there's quite a lot all around the country, but only a few places in the US with some COVID. Um, and at no point in our time period that we we're looking at was there a correlation um, based of like state COVID rates and state like screen time increases. Um, so also, you know, people are spending more time at home Obviously, so this is based on Google mobility data. Um, it's, you know, more close to time locked to, the, to those closures when it starts, right? Um, of course, we knew that um, the you know, schools closed right when all the, like, you know, workplaces, a lot of workplaces closed. But then you see, you know, it sort of decouple after that. Um, we also looked at parental mental health. And again, there was not a tight relationship. I mean, we know that like, parent mental health got worse after, um, uh, after the schools closed, um, but again, it was not tightly locked. Um, and in fact, um, you know, we were able to, in uh, some of these surveys, uh, find that um, screen time increased greater for parents who lost childcare relative to those who didn't. Um, and in fact, screen time increased in probably increased in proportion to the extra hours of childcare that parents were reporting. And we saw this across a number of data sets. Um, you might think, well, what about on the other side when school reopened? Um, well, here I have um, increase in screen time by schooling policy. Um, and you can see the uh, the kids who are online were getting the most recreational screen time. This is not counting school screen time. And the kids who are in-person schooling had the least um, you know, increase in recreational screen time. And we saw that across a number of, um, a number of uh, data sets. Um, we also actually instantly looked at parental mental health because there was this report that you know parent mental health was worse. Um, so you can see this in the Kaiser data, for instance. Uh, so the uh, the red and green are reporting more impact of um, or an impact of um, uh, of just the pandemic on mental health by parents. So this is for parents who um, reported having lost childcare. You can see much smaller effect for parents who do not report, uh, who report not losing childcare. And in fact, they look identical to non-parents. So the parent mental health effect was really specific to losing childcare. Um, and uh, we can see this in the Understanding America data. Here again, we have, you know, parent mental health. What's so up here is bad. And mental health was best um, for the parents whose kids were in-person 
schooling and worse for those um, who are online with hybrid somewhere in between. Census household pulse data actually allows us to look at number of days of hybrid schooling that are that have a live teacher. So we don't know if this is in person or not, but just how many days of teacher they had. The more of that, the better the parents' mental health. So in conclusion, screen time variability can be driven by childcare um, resources. Um, screen time and parental uh, stress um, um, can they look at it as like a, well, screen time in particular is an adapt maybe a, an adaptive response, right? So it's something that is actually helping parents cope and trying to take it away from overburdened parents may actually just make the problem worse. Um, this also suggests that cultural innovations may uh, interventions may have a limited effect. It wasn't that you know sometime in March every parent suddenly forgot screen time was bad, right? It had in you know presumably parents' beliefs about parenting didn't change their ability to act on them changed. So some caveats, of course, COVID times are not normal, right? So this may or may not generalize to, you know, all the rest of the time. And also screen time and stress may have their own negative impacts and maybe something that we do want to treat, even if we don't believe that treating them will actually solve the real problem, right? And that it gets us back to Again, you know, maybe we just had the model wrong. Maybe what we need to do is come in, bring dinner, help with laundry, free up a parent to engage in more play with their child. All right, thank you.